Amen. Well, good morning. It is so good to see you here. My name is T.W. Davis. I'm the the lead pastor here, um, and I am excited to be talking with you this morning. Uh, We are in our series called uh, I Got This, uh, which is Jesus. Uh, We're looking in Matthew, and it's Jesus experiencing all kinds of things. People coming at him. Thank you, Jim. People coming uh, to him, uh, people coming at him uh, angrily, uh, and Jesus the whole time is saying, I got this. I got this. Uh, Do you ever have days where you just go from one thing to the next? And, And... Sometimes they're planned errands and and, and appointments that you have, and sometimes they're just interruptions to your day that just keep on coming. And sometimes it's both. You got a busy day planned and interruptions keep coming, and you still have to get your stuff done. That's the kind of day that Jesus is having in this passage. And it started even even before this day. It's the kind of week he's having. Ever since he finished the Sermon on the Mount, it's been one thing after another. Healing a leper, raising the centurion's daughter from the dead, healing Peter's mother-in-law of the fever, teaching, calming a storm, casting out demons, healing a paralyzed man, avoiding a crowd, hanging out at a party with socially ostracized people, defending himself to the haters explaining things to well-meaning disciples of John the Baptist. And they just keep coming. And this passage shows he's got even more coming. You've had days, weeks, years like that, right? When this happened to me, I used to think it was a, like a, a, a scheduling issue or a calendar issue, that I'm doing a poor job of managing my time. And more recently, I've realized that it's more of a spiritual issue. And it's more of a question of presence. One of the things that strikes me about Jesus is, is that in these situations, it's, he's so present in the moment. In the moment, he looks at, he listens to, he pays attention to what is happening around him, but he sees and hears and engages with what's going on. It's as if he's always asking himself, What is going on in what is happening? What's the real need here? What is being asked of me? And what if each situation that you don't expect or is a little overwhelming or underwhelming or annoying, what if each of those situations is calling for and asking for a response? What if there are ways that God is providing for you to show that he is real and that he is present? What if, what if we're being asked, just like Jesus was asked, to live in the moment, no matter what God may be putting in our path, no matter what is, is pressing on us, no matter what feels like is insisting we pay attention? I want us to start looking for what God is asking us in every moment. Every moment. What if all the busy and the crazy and the unexpected issues and the scheduled events that don't go the way we want them to are just places and opportunities for us to trust in God and show the gospel to the people around us? And that's what we see Jesus doing throughout today's passage. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up, uh, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, it will be made, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players 
and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And when the crowds had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went through all that district. One passage, one text, two miracles. The, the story begins before it even finishes, before the story begins and before that could even finish, another story starts and takes its place. Now, why would Matthew, Mark, and Luke lump these two miracles together? Why would they make this miracle sandwich? I thought that was a fun picture, so we're using it. Why did they make this miracle sandwich? Why did they take these two slices of bread, the healing of Jairus' daughter and, and the healing of the woman with blood discharge and mash them together? And the most obvious reason is because this is how it actually happened. But I've got all kinds of, of, of preacher jokes about this. Why? What are the lessons we need to learn from this holy hoagie? Yeah, you like that one? Or how about what lessons make this supernatural sub sandwich so delicious? It's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> For the top slice of bread, we see Jesus is approached by a ruler. And we learn from Mark and Luke that he's the ruler of, uh, he is a ruler of the synagogue. His name is Jairus, and when he gets there, it's to ask Jesus to come and heal his daughter who is at the point of death. Matthew tells the story as quickly as possible because it's not about Jairus, it's about Jesus. Jesus is the focal point of his story. And Matthew introduces Jairus as a father who is asking for his daughter's life to be restored. Mark and Luke let us know that this, this father, Jairus, left his dying daughter to come to Jesus. I want you to look at Jairus' faith. Jairus doesn't offer compelling reasons as to why Jesus should come to his house. He doesn't mention his life of service to the synagogue. He doesn't say how well-behaved his daughter was or how better well-behaved she'll be if he brings her back. He doesn't make promises on how his life will change, his behavior will change if Jesus does this for him. He simply believes that Jesus' touch is life. He says, come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus confirms his faith by going with him. But as Jairus is leading through the streets to his house, there's a problem. Jesus has gotten popular. And there are people crowding around, and the crowd is getting in the way. They're trying to get a glimpse of, of Jesus, and they're pressing in all around him, and Jairus' eyes are following, and he's, he's darting through the people. He pushes his way. He's merging his way to get closer and closer because every moment is precious. Every second matters. His daughter is sick. And he turns around, and Jesus isn't there anymore. Jesus isn't with him anymore, and he stops, and he goes back to find Jesus, and he sees him, he sees Jesus there chit-chatting with a woman. And that's the bottom slice of bread. This woman's been suffering discharge for 12 years. She's gone to every doctor, every specialist she could find, and every effort has failed. Every bill she's had to pay for relief didn't bring it. Her last penny has been spent, and yet her life was still slowly draining away. But she had an idea. She thought to herself, if I only touch the fringe of Jesus' cloak, I will be saved. And our translations say healed, but the Greek word here is saved or made whole. I will be saved. Saved from what? Her affliction, her life, her sins? I don't know her mindset. I don't know. And to be honest, I'm not sure that she even knew. Because to any rational person, this is kind of a, a silly thing, even borders on, on superstition, right? 
But notice her faith. Her, she's uneducated. Her doctrine is severely lacking. She doesn't believe in the right things. Apparently, she doesn't even believe that Jesus is God because she's trying to sneak up on him. You can't sneak up on God. He knows everything. And all the other times that Jesus has healed people, he spoke to them, or he at least talked to them and knew about their needs and knew about them. And this woman thinks, what? She can steal power from Jesus? Sneak up and take it? Yes, her faith is impractical. Yes, her faith is potentially infantile. There wasn't anything special about Jesus' clothes. He wore the same type of clothes everybody else did back then. It seems kind of silly, right? To care about the clothes that Jesus wore. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Shroud of Turin before. It's a linen cloth that supposedly is the cloth that Jesus' body was wrapped in when he was put in the tomb. And it was given to the church in France in the 1300s. And the picture on the left is what the actual picture is the actual shroud. And the picture on the right is the negative. Supposedly to tell us what Jesus looked like. Now, many believe this is a relic and has, has powers. It's a relic of Jesus. What they've done, once they allow, were allowed to, they did studies on the linen. They did analysis of the blood. And it tells us that it's not old enough to be Jesus. It's not old enough to be Jesus. In fact, it's not even blood. It's not even blood. There have been zero miracles attributed to this cloth. Not to mention the fact that it didn't even appear until the 1300s. 1300 years after Jesus died. But it's passages like this like we're talking about today, that give people hope for anything Jesus wore or Jesus was wrapped in. And here in Matthew, this woman has it in her mind that Jesus is so mighty, so powerful, so gracious that just a brush of his cloth, a brush of his cloak will save her. So she gets close enough. And she reaches out through the crowd and touches his garment and is instantly healed. And Jesus stops to confirm her faith. He looks up, he looks her in the eye, and he tells her, Take heart, daughter, your faith has, and it's not made well. Our translation says made well, but in Greek it says your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. Now back to Jairus. Don't forget about him. You already did. Jesus didn't. When Jesus is speaking to the woman, someone from Jairus' house shows up, says, don't bother Jesus anymore. Your daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. And imagine the fight that had to be raging in Jairus' faith. But Jesus heals this. Sorry, Jesus hears this. And he confirms and strengthens his faith by saying, do not fear, only believe. Arriving at his house, Jesus sees all the people gathered there to, to weep and to mourn. And he talks to them and he says something that to our ears sounds as silly as the belief that Jesus' clothes can heal people. Go away. The girl's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laugh, and they mock him, and they mock his words, and he's not concerned about it. He doesn't care about their mockery. He marches straight into that house, takes the girl by the hand, and lifts her out of death as easily as you would help your kid after they tie their shoe. One text, two miracles, the healing of the woman, the raising of the daughter from the dead. Two slices of good, wholesome bread. Now, what is it that makes this miracle sandwich so tasty? You know it's coming. Miracle Whip. <laughs> I had to say it. I told you I wasn't done. 
All right. So what can we learn from this text? All right. What can we learn from this text? Certain, uh, several things. One, go ahead and pray for things that you think are silly. Go ahead and pray for things you think are impossible. Your prayers, whether they're big or small or impossible, do not bother our Lord. They do not bother our Lord. Don't be shy with your prayers. Don't hold back your prayers. If you're holding them back, that shows you don't trust in God. If you want your team to win the game, pray about it. If you want a good parking spot, pray about it. If you want your spouse to rise from the dead, ask God. And he won't laugh at your prayers any more than I did when my six-year-old told me he wanted to be an eagle so he could fly. Last night. You have to be willing to listen to the answer. And that's the key. You have to be willing to listen to the answer. And that answer could and very well might be no. No is an answer. No is an answer. His plans are bigger than ours. And I'm here to tell you this. If it is tough, it is tough to hear God when you've already decided what you want him to say. It is tough to hear God when you, you're, you know what, he might be saying no, but I'm waiting on that, yes. So I'm going to keep praying for it. It's okay to trust God with your desires, all of your desires. He loves you. Don't be afraid to ask. He knows your desires anyway. Next piece, what is next? Uh, whatever that weird meat is. <laughs> I didn't make this slide. I mean, the, the graphic. All right. Uh, next, don't look at how things are going in your life when you should be listening to Jesus. When your money's tight and you don't know if you're going to make it, when you're arguing with your spouse and you don't know whether or not they still love you or whether the, the relationship will, will ever be the same. When your children fall into sin and it makes you doubt every parenting decision you've ever made. When your health is so deep in the toilet, you don't know that you'll ever get out. In all those times, don't let sin creep in. Don't let sin make you doubt God's goodness, God's power, God's love for you. Let Jesus' words remind you that even if he doesn't heal you like you want, even if you don't get what you're praying for, just like the woman who was bleeding did, he's going to raise you from the dead. And when he, when he returns in glory, even if you don't get the things you want now, Christ will give you everything in his last return. Finally, I want you to realize that true Christian worship is faith against despair. When life seems hopeless or impossible, when the winds of despair are blowing, I want you to recognize that these are temptations and assaults from the world. And in those moments, Christ says to you what he said to Jairus, do not fear only believe. The greatest worship you can offer Christ is to trust in his words. Trust his words over everything you feel, you see, and you experience. Listen to the words of Jesus. He is there to comfort you. He's delivered you from the domain of darkness and transferred you to his kingdom. He's redeemed you. He, is, he has forgiven you. And nothing in this life can ever take that away from you. Always remember, Jesus has got 